Good afternoon and welcome to Ion Northeast Kansas, the podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Bruner. This is where we recap some of the top interviews you saw on Ion Northeast Kansas, the TV show. You can catch that streaming live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Central Time from our WIBW studios in Topeka, Kansas. Just check out WIBW.com. We had a fun day on Ion Northeast Kansas. So here's a little bit of the history. Uh, I MC every year the Vallejo Behavioral Health Unmasking Stigma event. Vallejo is a, an organization, a nonprofit organization in Topeka that provides behavioral health services. And so for this fundraiser, we decided to donate an item called a Red Couch Takeover, where people could bid on the chance to be a co-host for a day. Well, Amy Cop hasty who is actually the marketing and development director for Vallejo, was the high bidder. So we worked together to arrange some guests. And of course, she chose some guests that have a bit of a mental health focus on them. So when she came to co-host, one of the first people that she wanted to talk to were representatives from a company called Advisors Excel. They are based in Topeka. They are a financial services consulting marketing company, and they have made it a focus, especially the past couple years, to think about their employees' mental health, what they can do to support their employees. Amy wanted to know more about that. So Leslie Carr and Matt Beyer from Advisors Excel visited the studio, and Amy joined me in interviewing them. Thank you for being here with me today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having having us. us. And you were intrigued, Amy, about what they're doing at Advisors Excel. Yes, I have several friends that work at Advisors Excel, and we have two board members at Vallejo that work at Advisors Excel. And I know you have a robust uh, program for your employees. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so we have a traditional EAP program where they can get telephonic help or help with a network of providers here in town. Um, uh, Five visits are paid for through the EAP. Mm -hmm. That evolved into uh, a local EAP that we partnered with CFCC, Christ First Counseling in town, uh, to where they can get five in-person visits as well. Um, We just continued to add because we continued to add Mm -hmm. people and kept seeing the needs. So uh, the most recent thing is uh, a full-time counselor actually contracted through CFCC that's on site uh, at our gauge office. um, How marvelous. To the point where we had uh, so much use of of them that uh, We added a second person uh, just this last month. I'm curious, Matt, because I know this is something that's been personal for a lot of folks associated with advisors. What was it that inspired you to realize this is something we need to be paying attention to in our workplace? I mean, I think it started off with um, our advisors. We have a large network of advisor clients throughout the country, um, so we deal with a lot of people, and we just saw things with them, with their family, struggles and needs. Uh, We kept adding staff. We kept seeing it with staff and family. Uh, so uh, we wanted to provide more than kind of that traditional EAP option. Mm-hmm. Well, I am wondering um, why you see this as a value for your employees. I mean, it must be a cost uh, to your business. And so when you're looking at budgets and you're thinking about how are we going to make things work, how does this fit in and how do you prioritize it? Leslie? Because you do a lot. There's, I mean, it's more than just <laughs> yes. saying, okay, you can go see someone. You've got other things that you mm-hmm. do. Yeah, so I think it's important to remember that, first of all, our founders, Dave and Cody, really value um, taking care of our staff, um, making sure that they feel supported at work. And, you know, we spend a lot of time together. Mm-hmm. So making sure that, um, that we're happy and healthy. And that means mental health, too, not just physical health. Mm -hmm. So I think that that was key for them in terms of adding this as a pillar and saying, we want our company to focus on this. I think it's a huge issue. We also, and something to add to what Matt mentioned, um, we have an employee-run group that also provides uh, support to staff. So we have champions throughout our company who understand all of the resources that Matt mentioned and can explain them, but also if someone's just struggling or having a tough time, they can look for um, a little champion badge on someone's office door or cubicle and they know that that person's a safe person can help. Isn't that That's a cool idea. That yeah. is a great idea. And I know you and I <coughs> worked together um, over the last year or so on mental health first aid training at right. Advisors Excel. Yeah, so we, we really wanted to take that even further. And so we added um, Headspace, which is an mm-hmm. app that, that we pay for for staff and their immediate families. And then we said, we need leaders to understand the value of mental health. Stigma is a huge problem, Mm -hmm. uh, as you know. Yes, yes it is. Um, And and stigma can really mean, you know, judging people, of course, if they have mental illness, but also things as simple as 
um, they're really stressed or anxious and so maybe they wouldn't be best for this project. And we really want people to feel safe to share if they're struggling so that um, they can get the help that they need. Mm -hmm. So we said, let's partner with Vallejo and bring them over and have them do this training, which was free, which is great. Mm -hmm. It's a great service. Um, and train some of our leaders, our key leaders, so that they know how to respond when a, when a staff is struggling in a crisis or just, hey, I need a little extra support. Is it easy to have that flexibility, Matt? I mean, in the long run, is it worth having that flexibility to increase productivity? Yeah, I, mean, I think we've, we've tried to do some things with what we call the AE Life Center. So we, we have a financial wellness coach. Uh, we've got um, some physical resources with on-site medical clinic, and this was just another thing that um, we saw as a need that we could take care of for, for staff. Well, I know we're going to be taking a more in-depth look at it with your founder, Cody Foster, in our news on Monday. So we look forward to that story. Great. Glad you both could be here today. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you both. I such a very, very important topic, and you can learn more about Advisors Excel and, of course, find resources as part of our Hear Me, See Me project. That website is wibw.com slash hear me, see me, and we also do have a companion podcast for that effort as well. One of the other topics that Amy was interested in is learning how to support people in your workplace who you might suspect are impacted by domestic, domestic violence. Becca Spielman is the director of the YWCA of Northeast Kansas. Center for Safety and Empowerment. She visited the studio with Marlou Wagner of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas to find out a bit about what we can do to support each other and how BCBS actually has programs in place for their employees. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you for having us for sure. Yes. Yeah. When we're talking about domestic violence, yeah, those statistics, Amy, are just incredible. Mm -hmm. And so, Becca, what should we look for? What are the signs? Sure, so the way that we define domestic violence is we're really looking at a pattern of behavior in which a person is using harmful tactics um, to gain power and control over another person. So really, uh, it can be anything that involves a lack of consent in the relationship. Um, it could be emotional abuse or isolating mm -hmm. tactics that someone's using, um, any type of control that you might see in the relationship, speaking for that person, um, it could be something like withholding funds from an individual. Financial abuse is a very common tactic that we see um, in domestic violence. And of course, the big one that a lot of people think of is the physical abuse. Hmm. So let me ask you this. If you suspect or have concerns mm -hmm. about a coworker, um, this is a very sensitive topic. And yeah. do you say something? And if you do, what do you say? Absolutely, yeah. For us, it's really about um, kind of three things. One is expressing our care and concern for that individual. Um, so making sure that they know that it, what is happening to them is not okay, mm -hmm. that we care about their safety. Um, the second piece is validating and supporting them. So thinking about, you know, what is it that they want in this situation? How can we support them? Um, letting them know that it's not their fault and that they have the autonomy to make the decisions for their life. And then of course, the third thing is providing them with access to resources. So making sure that they know that they're not alone and that there are people who are available to help. Mm -hmm. And Marlou, um, at Blue Cross Blue Shield, I know you have a very um, impressive program mm -hmm. to help, the SAVE initiative. That's I correct. That. Uh -huh. Could you tell us a little bit about Most that? Most certainly. So right, SAVE stands for Shield Against Violent Environments, mm -hmm. and we started this initiative actually back in 2001. And um, again, back to domestic violence and the topic being so complex mm -hmm. and sometimes very hard to speak about. We also were understanding the impact that if someone is going through that, how it impacts them at their workplace. Mm -hmm. Not only for themselves, um, you know, coming to work and what does that mean if the perpetrator is following them, bothering them, et cetera, but we also looked at the fact of um, turnover and major health mm -hmm. issues and, and things like that. It's become even a little bit more complex now these days as we went through COVID. Beck and I mm -hmm. were just speaking about this because you think about the number of people working from home mm -hmm. and how that has impacted that. So we saw a need for that. Um, again, I know uh, both um, women and men are mm -hmm. survivors. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's a higher percentage, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, Becca, mm -hmm of women and uh, we have a high percentage of women in, in our workforce. Mm -hmm. So we felt it was very important to, again, explain the issue, 
Uh, so we have an internal perspective from um, how, do, how do we handle these situations mm -hmm. and YW has been tremendous to educate us about mm -hmm. what do you say as a supervisor if you think this is happening. It's a topic that's hard for um, a survivor to approach. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard um, and it continues to be that way unfortunately. But yeah, we're setting the culture of, like Becca said, you don't deserve to be treated this way. Mm -hmm. Um, there is help available. We want to help you when you're ready to do that. So mm -hmm. YW has been super important mm -hmm. um, to our employees for that. So you identify people that people can go to if people yes. are out there at home mm -hmm. and they're thinking, I'm ready to take that step. Mm -hmm. Who do they call or where do they go? Absolutely. So they would call our uh, hotline, our 24-7 mm -hmm. hotline. That number is 1-888-822-2983. Um, where advocates are available to help them in any way. Another difficult topic, and we appreciate you being here and all that you do. Thank you Thank for you. being here today. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. I have great respect for both your organization. Big thanks to Becca and Marlou for sharing what they're doing. And also a big shout out to Amy. She does a fantastic co-host for a day. So glad that she could be along with us. And of course, we'll be hearing more from her in her role with Vallejo as well. They are regular guests on Ion Northeast Kansas. Also in the studio this week, some folks from the VFW Post in Topeka, the Philip Billard Post. They do have some events coming up. They invite the community in for those. But they also wanted to enlighten us a bit about how the VFW is there to serve area veterans. San Sandy Hernandez and Michael Ogle were in the studio. And um, I'm sorry, I'm going to embarrass you and tell you, Sandy is also the reigning Kansas National Guard Person of the Year. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your service. And thanks Thank to you. both of you for your service and your lifetimes. We appreciate, appreciate that. For those who aren't familiar, Sandy, what is the VFW? Who can join and, and what do you? what is your mission? Well, right now, right, so you know, I just joined the VFW, uh, so I haven't been in for about a year. Oh, wow. So um, I'm a new member, and uh, my active role right now is to get new members in and to help out as much as I can with any of the uh, veterans that need, need assistance. So is this for um, anyone who has served in a foreign war? Uh, yes, that's correct. And does it mean it had to be a conflict or just serving overseas at any point in time? Uh, there's expeditionary medals okay. that go along with it. So if you, if you have a, a GWAT expeditionary medal or, uh, or Iraq campaign service medal or a Afghanistan campaign service medal or Vietnam uh, service medal, but the service medals that go along with um, membership. If you were on a submarine and you did a, a, a nuclear deterrence cruise, then you can join. And there's some sea service that also counts. So really just ask because it's a lot broader yeah. membership yes. maybe than yes, people yes, understand. Yes. What's the primary thing that you do then? Besides the social stuff that we're going to get to in a little bit because that's the fun stuff. But what other things? What do you primarily do for veterans? What do I primarily do for veterans? Uh, at the VF Post, I, like I said, I volunteer my time, which is what, what we really need at, at, at the VF Post that we have right now. And I, just to advertise what we do there, I don't really play an active, active role there, but um, I'm You're there as the support. Door. Yes, that's absolutely. Correct. And one of the things that you have done, Michael, you were telling me, is assist veterans when it comes to health care benefits. How does that work? Well, the VFW Kansas has secured two hundred and fifty million dollars in veterans compensation and benefits for for dis service connected disabilities. Then we work on a VCAP, State Veterans Assistance um, Compensation Program grant from the state of Kansas. In the 2023, we had $350,000 to secure the $250 million. The, the one VFW member and um, was a service-connected veteran who had burn injuries, and he um, was treated at KU Med. The bill was $500,000. That's $500,000 of, of federal tax dollars coming back to the state of Kansas to support our local economy. So it, it, it's a big deal what we do for veterans We've been here. talking a lot about homelessness as well in Shawnee County. You help the homeless veterans. Absolutely. All of our operations um, at the VFW Post 1650 go to meet the unmet needs of veterans uh, within the Shawnee County community. We're open to the public. We have Taco Tuesday, Bingo uh, Band Wednesday, line dancing instruction, and karaoke on Thursday. We have um, bingo band Friday and then a band on Friday and all those are open to the public and then we they all go to support and meet the unmet needs of veterans in the Shawnee County community all the proceeds and, and you have a special event coming up too right right we have What's the, that Sandy <laughs> a craft fair and so, what else is happening that day uh, yes yeah, that's correct uh, so as you can see we have a craft show coming up this Sunday uh, this is Saturday oh I apologize yep, it, right. it, it does Saturday. say Saturday <laughs> I, I apologize okay. it does say Saturday uh, you can come in you're welcome to come in from 9 to 3 and um, we'll, we'll have breakfast from 8 to 
10, 10.30, biscuits and gravy and food trucks will be out there locally as well. So if you see these flyers around, uh, come and join us. It's uh, VFW1650.org and then there's a uh, hit us up, uh, Philip Billard VFW1650 on Facebook or Last Call Lounge on Facebook, VFW1650. Um, all the ongoings of the post are posted there and if you'd like to get involved, send us a message. If you'd like to do anything with the craft show, please send us a message. Uh, we, are, we are here to serve the public, the Shawnee County community and, and, and veterans within our community. I think that's an important message too. I think sometimes people see a VFW hall and they think, oh, I can't go in there because I am not one who served. Right. You want to no, blow that myth and let absolutely. people know they should come. Yeah, yep. yep. you open should come to, to the post. We are open to the public. Awesome. Well, remember the craft show this Saturday and then all those other things you're talking about. I'm going to have those links on, on our WIVW.com website so that folks know who you are, yes. where you are, and all the ways you can help. Michael, Great. Sandy, thank you so very much. Appreciate A it. lot thank that you do. And it's always nice to let people know about it. Absolutely. Check out the Philip Billard VFW post or any VFW post near you so you can find out more about how they can be working in your own communities. Speaking of working, the construction industry is always looking for more people, more workers. It is in demand. And of course, we're always going to need new things. So it expects to be a very lucrative career in the future. That is where the Topeka Area Building Association comes in with its Build My Future event. Katie Nelson was in the studio because they are taking registrations. Students can nail down all their career options in the construction industry at a special event next month. Katie Nelson with the Topeka Area Building Association is here to appreciate my puns and tell us all about it. You like that? You got I what did. I did there, nail down. I did, nail I down. like that a lot. So this is called Build My Future. Yes. What is it all about? So the best way to, to describe it, interactive trade show for kids. And when I say kids, I'm really meaning more towards um, kids, young, young adults, students. Um, even if you've graduated high school, give us a call because it may be something you still want to look at. There might There's companies out there looking for employees. So this could also be a potential place for you to come and find a job. Um, we ended up placing people last year with jobs and we weren't expecting that. Oh, so wow. um, we placed a, almost a dozen people last year with jobs, which again, we're not, we were not expecting that. Especially but, when it's targeted to high schoolers. What types yeah. of industries are represented here? Oh my gosh. So we have um, our presenting sponsors, Custom Wood Products. Well, Custom Wood Products, gosh, they do everything, right? You know, they have cabinets. They have, they built my desk in my office. So, I mean, <laughs> they, they do so much. And they're such a big supporter of this because we have to introduce the trades to the young adults. Um, you know, I have four kids, right? Two of the four. They're in the construction industry. Hmm. I mean, in some aspect, you know, I've got one that sells doors and I've got one that is actually working for one of my sponsors at PDQ Construction. So we have a lot of the construction, the local contractors from right here that are doing this. We and have the just, welding. I was gonna say, it's not just like brick no. nails and wood mm -hmm. and, and you've got welding. We have welders coming, we have manufacturers coming, we have um, United Rentals just called me today and they're gonna bring some outdoor equipment again. So outside there's gonna be equipment the kids can actually operate. And that's what I was gonna say. That's why this is like taking a career fair to the next level yes. because of that hands-on aspect. I mean, look at that. And I don't know what racing those little go-karts had to do with it. That's just fun. That's just fun. That's okay. just fun. But <laughs> they, they actually get hands-on. Why yes. does this make it a little bit different than what a typical career fair might be? Okay, so when you go to a typical career fair, you're just going from table to table to table and they're just telling you, oh yeah, this is what we do. Okay, well, this is what we do. Here's a pamphlet, here's a flyer. Okay, here's a piece of candy. Go to the next table now. <laughs> I want to show you, let me show you an option A. Everybody says college, college, college. There's more options. Mm -hmm. There's other options out there and I can be your resource for that. The Topeka Area Building Association has made this great partnerships around this community and great strides in this industry to bring bridge the gap, excuse me, the average age of construction workers 60 years old. They're retiring soon. So what are we, what are we gonna do? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know how to install a door. I don't want to install a door. You want to hire someone to do <laughs> I want to hire and somebody those are the folks to, that you're bringing to to build my future. Exactly. Uh, when you think about high demand jobs, I think that's another thing that some young people think about as well when in terms of their future. Okay, I'm going to study this, but am I actually going to be able to get a job doing that? And this the jobs are endless and the pay is great. I mean, to all you young adults out there, the pay is amazing out there. Just pick up the phone, call us. Um, we'll take homeschooled kids. Um, if you're a teacher, 
you're a counselor, a principal, just call us. We'll get you in. We'll get you in the door. So get out there and make the connections. Yeah. The Build My Future event is taking place Tuesday, April 9th at Stormont Vale Event Center. So this is going to get underway at 8 o'clock and you have different times that people schedule when yeah. they would like to come throughout the day. You can find the application at buildingtopeka.org or email if you have any questions, info at buildingtopeka.org. And Katie, I understand you're not only taking the, the registrations right now for the students, you're also still looking for vendors, anyone yeah. who wants to participate. Mm -hmm. So the same information there? Yep, we're not turning people away. That's my goal. I don't want to turn anybody away. Last year we had to turn people away because we got too full. Uh -huh. I don't want to turn people away this year. So we have other ways to not have to do that. It's a big place. It is a big place. She's reorganizing. <laughs> Katie, thank you very much. Thank Build you. My Future taking place April 9th. Check out Build My Future. Could be very important for someone in your life or perhaps one of your colleagues, coworkers in the construction industry. March is Women's History Month, and we are having a lot of fun scheduling some very special guests on Ion Northeast Kansas. The first of them visited this week. For Women's History Month, some very important women leaders in our community are coming in to share their perspectives. We started things off with a very dynamic duo, Nancy Perry and Susan Garlinghouse. Nancy uh, got her start actually hosting a children's show in Topeka, worked for WIBW TV. She then was the longtime CEO of the United Way of Greater Topeka, which is now the United Way of Caw Valley. Susan is the founder of Topeka Collegiate School and was instrumental in getting the Kansas Children's Discovery Center built and off the ground. Let's hear from them. Welcome, ladies. So glad you both could join us today. Thank you. I'm so excited. And Nancy, I, I've long admired you for your work with the United Way. How did you get started First of all, in broadcasting, what happened that led you to become <laughs> Miss Nancy and have your magic mirror? Well, it has a little bit to do with having kindergarten experience because when they were hiring, you had to be between 25 and 30 with kindergarten experience. Believe it or not, that was the requirement. And a friend of mine, we talked about it with Sally Blair. She knew about the, she heard about it, read about it, and, and she said, Nancy, you've got to go do it. I can't, I can't go because I'm a middle school teacher. <laughs> and so I said, oh, I kind of wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. And she said, you, you, this, is, this job is going to be made for you, really. Well, anyway, I tried out, got it, and the rest is history. And I absolutely <laughs> loved it. It was really fun. How did that lead you into the United Way? Well, after I did that, then I did a kind of a talk program you for were a here, while. Yes. Uh huh. But uh, actually, Starks Vincent ca came and asked me, he said, would you ever consider leaving TV? And he said, I've got a job I'd like to have you interview for. And I said, well, I'll think about it. But I had to put a resume together because I was hired in May for teaching school for 501. I didn't ever have to have a resume. <laughs> so I had to get a resume in order to apply. But anyway, I was very fortunate. I did get the job. I know being a native Topekan was a lot of it. But that's basically how it was. So your journey went from, and I never want to say just a stay-at-home mom, because right. we all know right. what a job that that's is. Right. I, I don't personally. I know from watching other moms <laughs> right. in my life. But that's where you were, Susan. Where did your journey turn from being a mom to these things that are now part of our community's fabric? Well, we moved to Topeka in 1971, 72. And it was the elementary school that, our children attended was really fantastic. And as I look back, it was especially fantastic because they encouraged parents to be involved. So we could do all sorts of things. And we did. On Wednesday afternoons, parents would come in and we would have like gifted, it was before the gifted program, but they would come in and do different teaching items. And so it was really, really nice. But then Jardine for middle school became, a, and it was actually junior high mm -hmm. at that point, but it was very different. and. Our oldest was a really good math student, but no genius level. And she and her girlfriend finished math in February. They finished the book. And that was a little bit of a problem because I wasn't in favor of them doing nothing in math class. And so they said, well, if they would take a test, I first went to see Dick Driver, who was head of the department. Mm -hmm. And he said, we'll give them a test and we'll figure something out if they get 95 on the test. Well, one of them got a 93 and one of them got a 94. <laughs> so that was out. Yeah, just and, below. <laughs> and, you know, I'd never wondered until it became Women's History Month this year whether if they'd been boys, whether mm -hmm. something would have been done. But mm -hmm. I don't know that, so I'm just right. throw that mm -hmm. out there. But at the same time, 501 hired somebody to come in and talk to all the middle school or junior high teachers about brain periodization. And that was the crazy idea that the brain only grew at two-year intervals. So while they were in middle school or junior high, this was kind of a holding pattern. 
Well, that didn't really sit very well you with me either. You didn't want your either. kids to be in a holding pattern. Yeah. Really. So, and then the third thing that happened that kind of pulled everything together was something on NPR that I listened to about some doctors that had some newborn kittens and they wanted to know what would happen if they sewed their eyes shut and then two weeks later opened them. And they found out that the cats were, kittens were born, were blind for life. Oh no. So that kind of said to me too, maybe there's only correlation, maybe it's something else, but maybe the human brain needs encouragement and excitement more often than we know. Mm -hmm. And I kind just like thought- a precursor to what we would call brain drain today. Exactly, mm -hmm. pretty much so. So I just thought we've got to do something and that was to try to start what is now Topeka Collegiate. So you've established the things that, that really are your legacies around town, but it was a journey into leadership uh, for both of you. Susan, how did you go from not having people perceive you as such this troublemaking parent? You know, because that could have been yeah. what happened and you well, could have said, okay, I'm going away, but you didn't do that. You didn't back down. There was a little bit of that though. <laughs> Washburn Rural decided that since our school pre-K through eight did not have any kind of accreditation that the Kansas public schools had, they would not accept them. And if they came to that school, they'd have to start in kindergarten. How did you get to those challenges and rise above and meet all of them? Well, we had a really active board. Even the founding board was absolutely outstanding. And one of them just went to see his legislator, legislator in the Kansas legislature and said, hey, we got a problem. And the legislator wrote the superintendent of Washburn Rural Schools and the Washburn Rural Schools said, mm, we made a mistake there, they're welcome anytime. <laughs> How do you stay involved with the school today? I'm very, in, I'm very involved. I am still on the board there and I just, it brings meaning to my life in so many ways and the friends that I've met through that school, we share so many of the same values for humanitarian ideals and just a growth mindset that just never stops. Nancy, for you, the United Way is a service organization, but it's a business. I mean, if yes, you don't make yes. money, you can't do the That's programs right. and services. That's what was right. it like for you as a woman to walk into what at the time were male dominated boardrooms and say, I need your money and you need to support me? Well, the one thing I did was to get those big hitters on our board. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were so fortunate. We always had someone from Southwestern Bell, from the uh, energy, you know, banks. Uh, it, it was really a good time for me because, you know, at that time I could go into a local bank and I know the, I know the person by name, you know, after a few years, they weren't there anymore, you know, and some of the banks were just you know, branch banks. So it's a completely different fundraising right now, really. But I think because, I mean, I just love people. I mean, I, I sometimes I talk too much, but... So it was, it really was never a challenge and they were really, they did treat me really very, very nice. I never, I never had anybody say, oh, you know, it's her or, or well, I'll get, <laughs> I'll call you back. They really didn't. Of course, they were all professional business people too. But I, I really, I like that part going out. After a while though, I have to admit, I just, my, when I did decide to retire, I thought, I just don't think I can do one more. You know, you just, I just got burned out. But I loved it. I really did. 25 years is a long time to stay with something, but I did love it. What lessons do you impart to other women who maybe might, might feel some of those doubts? Like, is there going to be pushback on me because I'm a woman trying to step into this leadership role or trying to create something completely new and unheard of like you did with the Discovery Center for the capital city? I never felt any pushback. I really didn't. Um, and I think that we, it, Nancy and our generation is pretty much the same. We knew that men were the influencers. So we used that to our advantage. Right. I mean, we didn't take advantage of them really, but they were there for a purpose because they could make things happen. Mm -hmm. And we weren't in a position to make things happen yet. But then you were. But then we moved on. <laughs> and maybe that's the lesson. Persistence yeah. pays off, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. What would you want to say to young women well, today? Well, I, I think go for it. You know, I mean, really, don't give up. And, and I think a lot of it is the way that, that you're perceived, too. You know, I, I think um, some people just say, oh, well, they're not going to listen to me. Yes, they will. They will. And so I think just go in and be normal. But let them know what you want to do and tell them all about what it is that you're, that's going on or, or that you have to raise money for. I, I, I do want to say, though, 
Susan is well known at to be collegiate. I had the opportunity to go there. I know you did, yeah. And and one little girl said, "Do you know Mrs. Garling?" Yes, I said, "I do. She's a <laughs> friend of mine." I just felt, "Oh, wow!" <laughs> so yes, yeah, she is very involved. <laughs> People of all ages. Well, I appreciate both of you and what you have been able to build in our community and the legacy that you leave and have built for all the future generations. Nancy and Susan, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so excited well, to have you here. Thank you. Yes. It was such an honor to catch up with Nancy and Susan, and we have more great guests planned throughout the month of March for Women's History Month. You can see video of these segments and all of the guests that were on Eye on Northeast Kansas on the Eye on Northeast Kansas page of our WIBW 13 News YouTube channel. Check that out and hit subscribe while you're there. You can also find them on WIBW.com, and I post the links along with our studio selfies so you can get a look at the fun we have on my Facebook page, WIBW Melissa Bruner. Glad you give us could give us a listen. Until next time, we'll see you on the Red Couch.